In the last few videos, I've argued that you cannot hide information on the blockchain. Even if there is no specific getter function for a given variable, people can simply look in the storage and get the information they want. Now in this video, we will introduce a mechanism, the so-called commit and reveal scheme, that allows you to hide information through a combination of hash functions and off-chain storage, may you just reveal the information at a later point in time when it's not critical anymore. And in addition to that, we will introduce hashing and complex types. All right, let's get started. And of course, as always, we will build on our auction contract. Now, so far, we haven't hidden any sort of information in that auction contract. So uh, whenever uh, somebody uh, made a bid, then everyone could just see that bid, everyone could see what address it came from and so on. But there is a concept in economics that's called sealed bits. And the idea is, uh, game theoretically speaking, uh, that you have a simultaneous bidding, so that's a simultaneous game, not a sequential game, uh, with the intuition that people cannot react to the bits of their opponents, okay? So when there is somebody else uh, bidding, then you cannot base your next bid on that information because everything will happen simultaneously. Now, obviously on the blockchain, we have no such thing as a simultaneous action uh, because what people do is they issue the transactions, then they are part of the mempool already there. You can see the information and then they are uh, included to the blockchain in a clear sequence, in a clear order. So uh, the concept of having something simultaneously uh, simply does not exist. So we must implement that or emulate that principle in, in some sort of an, another way. And uh, again, this goes back to uh, what I've said earlier, that it's not possible to hide the information on chain. So it must be some sort of a combination of having information, at least for some period of time off chain and then later on revealing it. So what we're doing uh, in, a, in a sealed bit auction uh, right here is the bidders, they submit a, a sealed bit or a secret bit uh, so don't, that no bidder knows the bit uh, of any other participants so that it basically uh, you hide the information that is contained in that transaction and uh, only reveal it later on. Now, again, in an open auction, what we have done so far is you have, uh, let's say in this case, two bidders, uh, Alice and Bob, of course, there can be any number, N of bidders, and they have a, a certain valuation. Uh, we call it VA for Alice valuation, B, BB for Bob's valuation. And what you're doing is you have these incremental increases. Uh, what you usually see in these auctions is that there is a recurrent price. And as long as the price uh, is lower, um, as your valuation, um, you will increase the bid uh, incrementally if you're not the highest bidder at this point. And you will do so until your um, marginal cost for that item, so until when your bid essentially um, happens to be exactly your valuation, or of course, if nobody else uh, happens to bid against you, then you're, you're happy and then you're just remaining there. And these inc incremental increases, uh, they work just fine under normal, normal circumstances. Now in the blockchain context, when you think about that, what it means, it's not that great of an idea because what you would do essentially, if you're doing that on chain, is uh, creating, initiating new transactions. So let's say uh, we have first a transaction with a bid by Alice and then Bob as a higher valuation, he does not bid the entire amount of his valuation because uh, strategically it makes sense for him uh, to see, uh, to, to try to get information about Alice valuation and just increase the amount incrementally. And then of course, Alice is gonna react and Bob is gonna react again. So you have transaction after transaction after transaction. That's not a good idea. Also, I mean, that's not something we're doing here, but when you think of auto auction, uh, designs other auction types, like for example, Dutch auctions, uh, then a, a, an open bidding mechanism would be horrible because when you, when you think a Dutch auction, what it essentially does is um, you start with a certain amount, the amount comes down over time, and then at any given point in time, uh, somebody can simply strike and buy the item in question. Uh, so it's first come, first serve. That usually works fine in a, in a traditional physical auction context, uh, where you can yell in a room, for example, and say, yes, I'm gonna buy that. But in a blockchain context, where a transaction again, first goes to a mempool for everyone to observe uh, before it gets confirmed, um, you, could, you could essentially snipe that. You could wait for somebody else 
uh, and then uh, to, to, to try to buy it. And then when you see that, then you jump in, you pay a higher gas price, you pay a higher tip, and then your transaction may still be confirmed before the other transaction. This, of course, makes people reluctant in these time-based auctions because they know even if they see that somebody else uh, will initiate a transaction uh, to try to buy it, they can still react to that and just set a, a, a higher gas price, a higher tip, that is. okay. So there are all kinds of scenarios where it may make sense to hide the information in our context right here. Uh, what it is, what, what, what will happen most likely is that these people, they only have to issue one bid you know, that is based essentially on their own valuation. So they are maximum willingness to pay. And of course, uh, the expectations about everyone else's valuation. Uh, even if you have a really high valuation when you're expecting that there aren't too many other people who are taking part in that auction, then you're still not going to set your entire valuation. Uh, but what it does is it allows you to make the uh, auction more efficient in the sense that you can hide your information, you don't give the other people the information and therefore uh, you don't have to issue multiple transactions. You can simply do that uh, with your first commit and later on as you will see a reveal transaction. So in that sense, uh, first of all, it makes our simple auction, um, a sealed bid auction, it makes that particular contract somewhat more efficient in practice and it also is a super valuable building block for all sorts of other things. Uh, so for example, in voting, in, in all kinds of games where the player have to hide information uh, from the other player for a certain period of time. So these commit and reveal schemes you will look at, they are extremely powerful uh, mechanisms for all kinds of contracts you will use throughout this class and also when you're coding on later on. Now, essentially in sealed bid auction, as I said, that's just a summary, uh, participant, uh, participants bid quasi simultaneously. Um, it's not a sequential game anymore. Of course it still is when you look at it from a technical perspective, but we really are trying to emulate uh, a simultaneous game. So where both of these players or all of these players rather have to place their bids without having prior knowledge of somebody else's bit. That's the idea. Now, when we look at the problem once again, I already briefly mentioned that is uh, the transaction data is public. It's not only public when it's confirmed on the blockchain, it's already public when it is part of the network, when it's propagated throughout the network. Um, here again, you have Alice, and she issues, issues a transaction, a contract call transaction where she says, I bid three ETH and then this message in clear text form will be uh, propagated, relayed throughout the network. Everyone can just read that. Everyone knows what is going to happen later on. They see Alice's intention and that's obviously not good. And that again happens even before the confirmation that happens already when the transaction is part of the mempool. The way we're going to solve that, as I said, is through a so-called commit and reveal scheme. The idea of a commit and reveal scheme on a very high level, there are also more technicalities to it, uh, as you will see later on. But on a very high level is that you have two steps. In the first step, you send a hash of the bid during the bidding phase. So bidding phase, that's step one, that's phase one. Uh, you basically lock in what you want to do. You basically commit to a certain bit without revealing it. And that's what you use the, the hash value for. And then later on at a, at a later stage, you send the unencrypted value. So you send the clear text uh, to the smart contract um, as, as a second transaction. It gets evaluated better uh, when, when this is hashed, it corresponds to the hash value you have committed earlier. So it gets compared. Uh, so basically you're revealing the information. That's why we call this second step, the reveal phase. So let me show you that really quick in this animation down here. So you have Alice, here you have the auction contract, the sealed bid auction contract. So what Alice does in the first step is she computes the hash value of ibit 3 eth There will be some additional information in there. I will show you that in a little bit. But for now, just simply think of it as a hash value of ibit 3 eth and uh, this in a first transaction, a commit transaction, she stores that hash value on the smart contract. That is the commit. That's basically when she says, hey, I'm going to do something. I'm not telling you yet what I'm going going to do, but I will do something. Recall that no one else will be able to read 
uh, her message, they simply see the hash value. And if done properly, there is no way back from the hash value to the initial information. And then in the second phase, in the reveal phase, she gives the clear text message uh, so that everyone else will be able to just hash that and compare whether this hash value right here actually corresponds to the hash value that has previously been stored on the contract. And in that way, we can make sure that everyone had to lock in a bit uh, before revealing it, that we can make sure that everyone had to bit without having any prior knowledge of anyone else's bit. So that's the basic concept of these commit and reveal schemes. So again, you need two transactions. Uh, you have a commit transaction, the reveal transaction, but that's it. And uh, again, this can make things more efficient when you have otherwise uh, this incremental increase in the auction contract where, where you have multiple transactions for each and every person with just incrementally increasing the bits. And in this way, you simply have these two transactions for, for every single person and that's it, okay? So there is a, it's another problem. I mean, this was the first problem. How can we hide the information? Um, there is another problem, problem two, and that's how can we make the commits binding? Uh, I mean, you have to make sure that when somebody commits that it really is a commitment, that they really are forced to honor whatever they have said in the commitment. And that's actually not that trivial when you think about it. Uh, if you just have these messages, uh, then mm, the person could simply run. Uh, you cannot force them to send the value later on. So there must be some other form of ensuring that the uh, highest bidder pays if they win, that you can force them to do so. Um, as I said, there is no way to force the bidder later on. So the only solution we have is the value must be deposited at the time of the bid. So with the initial commit transaction, you're actually sending the value along. You're locking in the value in the smart contract and then it's stored there. It's in escrow. Uh, either if you win, then uh, it will be used and it will be sent to the beneficiary later on, as we have seen in the simple auction contract. And if you are not the highest bidder uh, when the uh, auction uh, concludes, uh, then again, as in our previous example, it lost with you, you can simply uh, withdraw that value. So the problem we have now is, even though the commit itself, the information can be hidden. So whatever you're specifying, as, as, as the text in our example, when Alice said, I, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to bid three ETH, you can hide that text through hashing. Uh, what you cannot hide on chain, obviously, is the value that is being transferred as part of a transaction. Uh, you cannot hide that for good reasons, because essentially that's something that is part of the consensus protocol, something that has to be verified. You're transferring value, and this value, of course, has to be adjusted on chain. But that's a, that's an issue when you can just simply observe the value that has been sent. So the, the ether amount that has been sent alongside the transaction, how can you still keep these bits secret? And the solution is uh, somewhat simple, actually. Uh, you simply allow for fake bits. And uh, there are two ways of fake bits. First of all, the value doesn't have to correspond. I should rather say the value you're sending alongside your transaction. So the actual, actual if you're sending along the transaction does not necessarily have to correspond with what you're setting as the value in the commit. And number two, you can even have a special fake indicator in your commit. And I will show you what I mean by that, where you're specifically declaring that this bit is fake and then it will not be, uh, it will not count later on. Okay. So with the value of the deposit, there are essentially three uh, scenarios. Number one, your deposit. So whatever you're sending along the transaction in ETH is smaller than your bit, then it's, it's quite easy. The, the bit is invalid. Uh, and you get a full refund. So this essentially is just you saying, hey, um, I, I never had the intention of actually making this work. Uh, I did not even include the required deposit. And in that case, it's a fake bit, okay? In that case, it's invalid and you get a full refund, but it doesn't count as an actual bit when you're revealing it. Number two is the deposit is uh, exactly the same amount as the bit, then if the bit will be valid and there is no refund, uh, so let's assume if you're the highest bidder in that case, um, then the contract will simply keep at the amount, will forward it to the beneficiary uh, when we wrap up things, but you will not get a refund um, if you win. And then the last scenario is when the deposit is larger than the bid, then the excess deposit, which is the deposit minus the bid value, will be refunded to your address. 
And uh, as you can see right here, of course, when you have uh, three different scenarios where the deposit value can be either larger or smaller or equal to the bit amount, it doesn't contain too much information about what you actually did. Um, of course, it's still the, the value you're sending along still sets the maximum value for a, a legitimate bit. So, you know, uh, the, the actual bit, uh, assuming it is a, it is an actual bit, it's a legitimate bit, cannot be any higher than whatever has been sent along uh, uh, as part of that transaction uh, value that is. But other than that, you really have no additional information uh, about the bit itself. And that's uh, something uh, that comes really close to sealing, uh, to have a, having a sealed bit where no information at all is leaked. That's uh, probably as close as we get. There are some other mechanisms you could think of, but that's a, a, a good one if you want to hide the information uh, of the bit. Now, additionally, what we can do, it's not necessary because you implicitly already have that um, with or, this scenario right here where the uh, a deposit simply is smaller than the bit. But what you can do and what we are going to do, in fact, is you can allow the bidder to secretly state if the bid is fake or legitimate. So just have another variable in there, a uh, Boolean, where you're saying one or zero, one means, okay, it's legitimate. I have the intention of actually uh, paying that. I have the intention of actually making this a legitimate bit or zero, it's fake. It's just to mess up the information uh, set of other players. Um, it's these mind games. I never had the actual intention of making this a, a true bit. Uh, it's just to manipulate my opponents and to uh, mess up their information set. So how do you hash that? Um, I mean, we have talked about hashing in theory. Uh, we have seen that video uh, from the Bitcoin blockchain and crypto assets class, where I said you should also watch that for this class right here. But you can, of course, do that in Solidity. You can do that on chain as part of a contract execution, as part of a contract call. And uh, how you're doing that is you have this uh, catch hack 256 hash function. Uh, it uh, takes bytes and returns bytes 32. Okay, that's the, that's the return value you get. And it can be used for any arbitrary input. So um, any length, whatever you want to do, as with any regular hash function. And you always get back these bytes 32. So uh, 256 bits, that is, which is not surprising, considering that we're talking about catch act 256. So creating a byte array from any variables, how does it work? Well, what you need to do is you have to ABI encode them, ABI encode pack them. Uh, what this does is essentially it removes all of the uh, zeros, all of the padding in front of it. Uh, so when you have some variables that do not need the entire 32 byte storage and have some leading zeros, then these get removed. Then all the information is concatenated. Uh, it is uh, concatenated to a single byte array. And uh, then this uh, byte array uh, will be hashed. Okay. So it's basically the encoding, ABI encode packed will create a spite array and then uh, using that to hash it with the catchak 256 hash function. What will hash? Well, there are more parts than just the value of the bit as in our initial example, I already said there that of course, um, that's just the motivation that wouldn't be sufficient. And I will show you uh, in a little bit why it wouldn't be sufficient. Uh, but we, what you have in there is first of all, the value of the bit, Second, the indicator, whether the bit is fake or real, uh, which of course also has to remain secret. And then as a third part, what you're also adding is the secret also referred to as a salt in many cases. And this is super important. This is just some random information you're putting in there that prevents other people from guessing your the values you have set in uh, one and two. So you just uh, need some entropy right here and this entropy prevents them from guessing. And that's an important part. Why is this important? Well, assume you have, a, let's say, a situation where you see a hash value on the blockchain that has been committed, okay? So you know Alice has sent a commitment transaction right here, and that's the hash value she has sent. And uh, it would indeed just be that the message always is, I bit X Eve. 
um, then what you could do as a sufficiently motivated attacker is just try all kinds of different, different values for this x right here. So let's say x always has to be a value between 1 and 100 as an example. Uh, then you can simply um, loop over um, these uh, different values for x in this case and uh, at some point you will find out that there is a hash which corresponds to this hash right here and then you have the value so you can essentially what you could do is you could prove for brute force the information that would be really really bad okay that's something we have to avoid and in order to avoid that the solution is quite simple the solution as i said is to add some arbitrary information to the input uh, that's the salt or secret that's essentially where the entropy comes from that prevents other people from doing it exactly what you're seeing right here from trying to attack to guess the other values uh, and uh, in our case uh, we use a string for that but it can be any other uh, sort of data just essentially it's the best way to do that is when this information when this data is random when it's really uh, entropy when it cannot be guessed uh, but then you can you can use any sort of data because any sort of data will always be converted to a number at the end of the day. So um, you can use whatever you want. In our case, as I said, we use a string. Uh, honestly, the main motivation to use a string is because we haven't introduced strings yet. So this is a way to, for you to play around with strings uh, and the way for us to sneak in an example with strings into this lecture. Um, and then, of course, a string, as in uh, as always, just stores some text. The way you're doing this is you're declaring it with these quotation marks right here, uh, or double quotes. And uh, what you can also do, and I think that's um, just a, an interesting side note, is you can even use emojis. Uh, you can, whenever you have the uh, um, prefix Unicode, uh, then you can use all kinds of Unicode's characters and uh, since emojis are part of that, you could also use emojis in your secret uh, or in any other string for that matter. Now let's create a generate sealed bit function. Mm, it's essentially just a function that allows you to create these commits. Okay, that allows you to choose some parameters and then get the hash value back, the hash value that will be part of the commit. And uh, let's go through, go through that really quick. So you have the function, we call that function generate sealed bit. Um, as a parameter, as a function argument, you have an unsigned integer uh, underscore bit amount. So that's the first one. Then the Boolean is legit. Uh, that's the uh, one or zero where you're specifying whether uh, your bit is legitimate or it's just a fake bit to mess up the information set of the other people. And then you have a string which is called secret or salt. We will come back to this mem memory uh, statement right here. Memory essentially just uh, specifies the, the uh, data location. So it's the opposite of storage. When you have storage, then it will be actually stored as part of the contract. Uh, with memory, it will only be used in the context of this function call. Um, but we will come back to that in the next video where this will be properly introduced. Uh, for now, that's all you need to know regarding memory. And then we have this function set as a public function, a pure function. Recall that pure, as we have looked at, I think, two videos ago, pure means that you're uh, neither reading from the state nor writing to the state of the blockchain. So this function can be thought of as somewhat of a helper function. Uh, where you're doing something, but it, it's not dependent on the current state of the blockchain, the current state of the smart contract, and it also doesn't change anything there. It simply is used to, uh, in this case, compute the hash value of these arguments. And uh, also what it does right here, it returns uh, bytes 32, which is the sealed bit that's essentially the hash value we're going to give back. Then in the function body, we are assigning the sealed bit as the catch 256 the abi encode packed uh, of bit amount is legit and secret so of these function parameters so we're first going to encode that as i said and then we're computing the hash value from it and then we're storing um, this hash value in sealed bit storing not in the sense of storing on the blockchain that would be wrong that's not what you're doing recall it's a pure function but i should rather say you're returning it so you're giving it back uh, to uh, 
uh, the person has called this function. Now, what is super important, once again, there is no trace of a pure or a view function called stored on chain. So when you're doing that with your own full node, then no one will be able to see even that you have interacted with that function. It's a little different when you're using, let's say, a block explorer like Etherscan, and uh, you go to the uh, contract read tab and you're using it there, as we will do in uh, our solutions, just for simplicity, because then you have to trust that the uh, the uh, provider of this service uh, doesn't actually store the information, doesn't store the parameters you're putting in there, doesn't store the fact that you've called this function. But when you're really doing that with your own full node locally, and you can do that, then there are absolutely no traces whatsoever. And in any case, there are no traces on the blockchain itself. The reason why you're implementing that um, as part of the smart contract is twofold. First of all, later on, we have to verify uh, the commitment, um, basically look if the, whatever has been disclosed in the re reveal step does hash to what has been provided as part of the commit step. And of course, then it's really nice when you can reuse the same uh, function, when you can um, basically make sure that things are hashed in exactly the same way, that they are encoded in the same way. That's something you couldn't guarantee when, you're, when you would create this hash value, for example, of a different programming language. Uh, in theory, of course, the hash function should result in the exact same thing. But because there are always, there's always a risk of some differences in the encoding, in the way you're assembling the pre-image, uh, in the way you're concatenating things, you're, you're cutting out things like the padding. There may be some slight differences, and the slight difference when you're computing a hash value will have uh, catastrophic consequences. It simply will lead to a completely different hash value. And that's why it's always a good idea to use the same function when you're creating these commits as will be used then whatever is revealed later on is being compared to the initial commit. That way you can be absolutely sure uh, that the, the, two, um, the two function calls will lead to the same results because essentially it's the same function that is getting called, okay? Now let's look at the actual contract. Um, of course, we're gonna keep the basics from our simple auction contract, so we're not gonna change that. But we have to split the auction into two periods by setting an end time for both periods. Um, we can actually see that right here, you have a bidding end unsigned integer and you have a reveal end unsigned integer. Now we're gonna keep the beneficiary up here. Uh, of course, it's still gonna be immutable. And then uh, what we have right here, you already know that is the unsigned integer of the highest bid of the highest bidder. Uh, here we have the Boolean has ended. So that's exactly the same as in our previous contract. Let's jump to the next slide where we continue uh, again here. The mapping of the pending returns is the same. Uh, I've kept the auction ended event. Um, I did remove the event that is associated with the uh, bidding function for one simple reason. We have to recreate the bidding function anyways. As you will see, we have thrown out the bidding function because it will be implemented completely in a different, in a completely different way. Uh, and also the event must be implemented in a completely different way. Uh, we also remove the function that uh, allows you to end the auction, but the event, we can leave it here. Uh, because that will be implemented in a similar similar way. So we can just leave it in here for now. In the constructor, we still have the beneficiary, but now we have duration bidding minutes and duration reveal minutes. Uh, so two function arguments, uh, two parameters. And as you can see down here, then we set a bidding end to block.timestamp plus underscore duration bidding minutes uh, times one minutes. And again, also as part of the constructor, we set reveal end equals bidding end. So we use the bidding end as a reference plus duration reveal minutes times one minutes. Uh, obviously, the reveal end will always be set in relation to the bidding end because the reveal phase is always after the bidding phase. That's why you use uh, bidding end here as a starting point. The withdraw function remains unchanged. That's exactly what we have in our previous, uh, what we had in our previous video in the previous contract. Then let's proceed. And the last thing we just discussed that, so I'm not going over it in detail. 
uh, again is the generate seal bit function that's also something uh, you have to add of course now um, just to be very clear on that that's not the entire sealed bit uh, auction contract yet um, in this video we just introduced the hashing some complex types uh, the, basically the way you can generate the hash value that will be used for the commit but the bidding itself and the resolution and all the logic that is needed that will be part of the next video that's not something we're doing right now uh, in this video i just want you to get comfortable with the with the idea with the theory and also of coding um, this pure function that allows you to get the hash value uh, a true a true a, a, a true function to an actual functional call that's the idea next thing we're going to look at are structs in our case structs are used to keep track of hash sealed bits of the corresponding deposit amounts but of course you can use uh, structs whenever you have some associated information that relates to each other uh, for example when you have an object that has various data points uh, some sort of metadata you could say uh, then you can store that in one struct and then it's clear that it, that it relates to the same object that it's part of the same object and that you have just these different data points uh, that relate to that object it's a complex user-defined type um, with any number of properties and in our case the way it would look like is we have uh, definitions say struct bit and uh, we're creating the struct in the form that it contains bytes 32 and we call that property right here sealed bit and then we have unsigned integer and we call that property deposit okay so it allows us that in a bit you basically combine these two informations you combine the bytes 32 and the uint you combine the sealed bit so the um, commitment hash and the deposit uh, amount um, so the, whatever you have sent along the transaction uh, in one struct the bit can now be used as a, a variable type so you can create uh, um, variable that is called new bit you say it's of type bit so that's the that's the type is the struct you have just defined up here and um, then you're uh, assigning the values by saying bit and um, then in the first property you're storing whatever results from the generate sealed bit with the arguments uh, 50e18 so that's essentially 50 if when you're when you're defining it in in uh, in a way uh, then uh, true so that's the boolean that you're setting to one and secret that's the string in this case you just use the word secret as an actual secret and here again you have the 50 eve as the value you're sending along um, which is in this case um, the deposit value the unsigned integer right here that's the way you're defining it um, you can use structs in mappings and arrays and structs can also contain mappings and arrays that's something that's extremely important something we'll also make uh, quite heavy use of later on so the way we could store a bit is by using a mapping uh, essentially what you would do is use the address as a key right here and then you could ask for a bit value uh, but the issue is that you will run into situations where users want to create multiple bits so whether uh, for example the information set has changed they haven't expecting uh, they haven't been expecting that there is so much going on and now they see that there are transaction flying around left and right and uh, they get really nervous and they want to increase their bit let's say or maybe they want to use the same address to create some fake uh, bits uh, for w whatever reason uh, i can think of, of many examples but essentially we must keep it flexible enough that one address can create multiple bits and you're doing that uh, by using a variable size list of elements that is innumerable and that's a dynamic uh, size array arrays in solidity uh, you can declare in two ways either you give them a specific length k right here so you could say this as length two length three uh, or any length you desire and then it's specifically set or you can keep it dynamic and that's what we're using in this case because we don't know how many bits somebody is going to store uh, ex ante so we just want to keep that flexible and then you just leave that uh, empty uh, in the brackets and uh, then it's dynamic sized both array types have the length property where you can ask how many elements are part of that array fixed arrays will always return k 
obviously, because that's the length you set, that's the fixed length you set. Dynamic arrays will uh, return the current length, so the current number of elements. Dynamic arrays have the push and pop methods. Uh, with push, you're adding an element at the end of the array, and with pop, you remove an element at the end of the array. Um, so that's that's the idea that basically that comes from the uh, stack based languages that you can add some elements or you also remove the topmost element or the last element in that case from the array. And that's push and pop. Now, the way you're doing that is we, we use the mapping to store the dynamic array or the variable size list for each address. You can see that right here, you have the, excuse me, right here, you have the mapping, you have the address and uh, use the address as a key. And then you have this dynamic size array called bit right here um, that returns a list of all the bits that are stored for this specific address. Okay, that's the idea. That's the way we will implement that. Again, we will not do that right now. In this lecture, as I said, it's only about the uh, theory of the commit and reveal schemes. It's only uh, about creating the hash values you will need to commit. Uh, but we will look into that in the next uh, video where we are creating the actual logic for the sealed bit contract. All right, so the last thing we have to do is the exercises. Uh, exercise one will turn to ENS, Ethereum name service. And uh, the first thing you should do as part of the preparation is quickly read through the documentation of ENS, where they talk about the implementation. The links are on the slides. And then once you're ready, you can go to Etherscan. Also, the link is on the slide, uh, the link to the ENS contract, and uh, use the make commitment function there uh, with the parameters Vitalik, uh, the owner address as specified on the slides, and also the secret as specified on the slides. And then you should get back a hash value, a commitment hash value um, from the uh, make commitment function of the ENS contract. The second question is, assume that someone created the commitment hash and you have this commitment hash, you know it. So we assume that somebody has created the commitment transaction that you can see it. And uh, also further assume that you know that they have used the same owner address as specified in uh, question one and the same secret as specified in question one. Will you be able to find out which name of the following four names they have registered? So either Vitalik, Aaron, Mary or Patricia. Uh, how could you do that? Why can you do it? And of course, this relates to the entire discussion we had about brute forcing. Uh, in the absence of an unknown uh, secret. And then in question three, uh, assume someone created the commitment hash as specified on the slides. Uh, they use the owner from question one, but you do not know the secret in that case. So you do not know the salt value. Will you be able to find out which of the names they have registered? Now let's look at the solutions. All right, so let's look at the exercises. So here you have the uh, documentation, also of the make commitment function, and here we jump to Etherscan. You are on the contract tab already. Note that you are on the mainnet version of Etherscan. If you also want to switch your MetaMask, you can do that here, but we do not necessarily need that since we're only talking about read functions. If you want to see the entire code, you can find it here. That's the code of the ENS contract, if you want to look through it. And then you have the option again up here to go to the write functions. You could connect to Web3 if you're connected to mainnet. These are the functions that write to the blockchain, but here on the read tab, this is where you're reading the information and that's the make commitment function right here. So here we have the parameters, name, uh, owner, and uh, the secret for name uh, use Vitalik. So we're gonna copy that, copy and then going back really quick, put it into the name string right here. Then we switch back again. We take the owner address from the slides, copy it, go back to the owner argument of the function. And then here we have the secret and uh, we we'll also copy the secret and we add that right here to the secret and then we can 
press on query right here and you will see you have the hash value down here here the bytes 32 uh, that's the corresponding hash value that you could use for the commit transaction now let's quickly go back and look at the second question and then the second question we assume that we have the commitment hash so you know that it starts with 5af and so on and then we check which of these uh, names will lead to that hash when we have the secret and the owner. So we know the secret and the owner is the same as in question one. And now we're just going to test some different names. We already know that Vitalik is not the one that will lead to the 5AF80. So let's try Aaron. Uh, let us put Aaron in here. Query once again. No, it starts with uh, 0x98. And let's check Mary again. Owner and secret remains the same as stated in the question. So we have Mary. We query that. Ah, and here we go. You see 5AF and so on. And also when you check in the back really quick, uh, E823. Uh, yeah, we can see that right here. So we know that Mary is the one that leads to this hash. Now we have been able to brute force that because we have known the owner and the secret. Um, in case of question three, we do not know the secret, specifically stated that we do not know that. And in that case, we simply will not be able to tell which one of these three names will lead to the corresponding hash value. Uh, you have enough entropy with the secret that you could make the argument that it's any of them. So there is simply no way to obtain the solution. And that's exactly the idea. That's the protection against brute forcing uh, that we rely on. And that's the reason why we have the salt in there, why we have the secret in there to prevent somebody from brute forcing the information. Now let's change to our next exercise. Uh, first thing we do is we are creating this new sealed bit auction contract. And we're switching back to the simple auction, uh, command and A or control and A and copy it and then you paste it here in the sealed bit auction so that it's the same and now we're going to change the contract a little bit so the first thing we are going to do is we delete this event the from, from the from the bits um, then we delete the bit function as well um, we will re-implement that later on with the uh, new version and uh, another thing we are going to delete is the auction end function so we're also gonna, right here, we're gonna take that and delete it. That's also something we will re-implement later on, actually in the next video, uh, when we have the entire sealed bit auction. But then we have a few more things we have to adjust. So first we're gonna remove the end time because we need two different versions of that. So UINT public bidding end. Okay, and then the second one, UINT public, and that's, reveal and so we have both versions and of course we also have to add them to the constructor so in the constructor the first thing we have to do is adding the uh, uh, parameters so the duration minutes it's not sufficient anymore we need two versions of that so we have duration um, bidding minutes and, and then a second uint unsigned integer that is duration reveal minutes all right and uh, then we have to set the variables so it's not end time equals uh, again we have two versions so it's bidding end equals block timestamp plus duration bidding minutes times one minutes and then the second one that's reveal and equals bidding end plus duration reveal minutes times one minutes so then we have to add the function that allows us to generate the commitment hash we have function generate sealed 
bit. And this function takes three different arguments. So the first one is an unsigned integer, underscore bit amount. The second one is a Boolean value, underscore is legit. And the third one is a string. Uh, again, we have this memory statement right here for the data location we will talk about next time. And that's underscore secret. So that's the salt value we have right here. We make the function public and we make it pure. It's not going to operate on the state. It neither reads it nor changes it. And it returns something. It returns bytes 32. And we call it sealed bit. All right. And in the function body, in the function body, you're having the actual hashing. So we say seal bit, we def define it here, equals catch act 256. And we use ABI encode packed. And within that, we have the three arguments. So the first one is bit amount. The second one is, is legit. And the third one is the secret. So they get uh, encoded and then hashed uh, with the catch act 256. So we also have to change the name, of course. So we change that to sealed bit auction right here. Uh, and then we try to compile it. So we check the compiler version. Yes, it's same as a pragma statement, we compile it and we see there are no issues. We check if we are on Injected Web 3 once again, we see we are on Robston, we have the address. Here you have the deployment parameters. Unsurprisingly, it's just what we have defined in the constructor. So the two duration arguments, we go with 10 and then we copy the address and set our account one as the beneficiary. We send a transaction, MetaMask asks us to confirm, we click on confirm and quickly check on the block explorer if the contract deployment succeeded. And this is as always going to take a while. Oh, here it is, success. That's the confirmation. Uh, let's, let's check deployed contract. So we see it right here. And here you have to generate sealed bit function. So that's equivalent to what we have done with ENS, uh, bit amount 100 is legit one, so it's true. And then a seek, which we just type, this is my secret. Let's operate on that. And you can see right here, bytes 32 on the bottom, that is the resulting hash value. That is your commitment hash you're getting from your own function. Recall, we didn't operate on the blockchain, so there are no traces of that on the blockchain. Of course, you have to trust the front end. So in this case, you have to trust Remix but there isn't anything about this operation stored on the blockchain. All right, I think that was another big step. We have implemented hash functions on chain. We have looked at commit and reveal schemes, introduced complex types. And with that, we have everything in place to implement the rest of the sealed bit auction in the next video. Stay curious, see you soon.